Okay, well, um, good morning. Uh, I'll provide a, a short overview of Laurel's first 25 years from my perspective. Can you hear me better here? Okay, I'll get right up on top of the microphone then. Um, that's good, that's good. So uh, I gotta thank um, Director Debbie Lee for her presentation because when I put mine together, um, it covered several of the topics that she included and then I realized it was way too long so I cut them out and that was really fortuitous. So anyhow, um, in the interest of time, I'm uh, restricting my discussion to uh, GLURL's origin, uh, science program history and budget histories. I won't be discussing GLURL scientific contributions because that's what you're here for the next two days you're gonna be hearing. Um, also not included, but very important are the histories of GLURL's facilities and support units, which, which Debbie did mention. Um, this doesn't imply that they were not important to achieving GLURL's mission. They were extremely important, but I just don't have time to cover everything. Uh, so I'll briefly move on uh, uh, after I discuss how the lab came into being. I'll br briefly move on to the directors who guided the lab through the first 25 years. Uh, and then uh, looking at how the organization changed um, during that period, it provides some uh, introspection or some insight into GLURL's evolution. Finally, I'll cover the budget troubles during the Reagan years and how GLURL muscled its way through. Um, I would say GLURL is the culmination of a series of crucial events that led to its establishment. And uh, those events are highlighted in red on my slides. So precursors, as already mentioned, um, back in 1841, Congress established the Lake Survey and charged it with uh, basically surveying the Great Lakes. They, I think they called them the North or the Northwestern Lakes then, but I found three different references. One says the Great Lakes, one says the Northern Lakes, one says the Western Lakes, but it was the Great Lakes. And uh, that was uh, uh, put under the uh, US uh, Army topological, Topographical Engineers, which later, of course, became the Corps of Engineers. Originally, it was located, the office was located in Buffalo, New York, and then later moved to Detroit. Um, and Congress tasked it with uh, surveying the Great Lakes. And um, uh, that was the early beginnings of actual lake surveys. One of the interesting aspects is if you go to the Glural Lobby, I think it's still there, there's a, um, a uh, basically a, a hydrographic or bath bathymetric survey a navigation chart, if you would, of the Great Lakes from about 1859 or 58. And the chief, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, chief engineer on that project was the uh, general who, who won the Battle of Gettysburg later on in about five years. Anyhow, uh, jump to the beginning of the 1960s and uh, the nation uh, um, uh, was awakening to, uh, well, the environmental movement was gathering political steam Rachel Carson, pub, pub, Rachel Carson published her book, Silent Spring, and the nation was awakening to the need to understand and protect our environment. So in 1965, President Johnson created the Environmental Sciences Science Services Administration, or ESSA, within the Department of Commerce. ESSA was formed by combining a number of existing federal scientific programs, including the Weather Bureau, the Coast and Geodetic Survey, which were already in commerce, and um, uh, several other smaller um, programs from other agencies. ESSA was the first federal agency to include the word environment, by the way, in its title. Uh, Dr. Robert White, pictured here in the upper right, um, was uh, the head of the Weather Bureau at the time and was appointed the first administrator of ESSA. This will prove uh, instrumental and crucial to GLURL's creation. Uh, also in 1965, the International Hydrologic Decade, or IHD, was established under UNESCO. Um, and um, this will also prove uh, to be critical to GLURL's creation. A program uh, under the IHD for the Great Lakes was approved called the International Field Year for the Great Lakes or IFIGL. Uh, and uh, to be planned and conducted jointly between Canada and the US, Lake Ontario quickly became the focal point for a, an intensive field year of research scheduled for 1972. Um, responsibility for planning and management of the U.S. part of IFIGL fell on the Lake Survey Office in the Corps of Engineers. In 1966, Congress created a Blue Ribbon Commission on Marine Activities known as the Stratton Commission. The Stratton Commission, after 
several years of study and so on, uh, re released their final report in 1969, where they recommended the creation of a new environmental agency to provide scientific focus on oceans, on the oceans and atmosphere. And I believe they proposed to be called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. <laughs> in any case, um, NOAA was the outcome of that report and it was established in the Department of Commerce on October 3rd, 1970 by President Richard Nixon. Interestingly, uh, people say, why was it put in commerce? Why not interior? And uh, word has it, and I can't verify or, or deny this, that at the time uh, Nixon was having a, a, a fight, a disagreement. He was unhappy with his Secretary of Interior, uh, Walter Hickel. So uh, as a result, uh, Nixon punished Hickel by putting, uh, or actually leaving, if you would, uh, NOAA in, in commerce. Uh, now, NOAA was formed um, by uh, uh, combining um, ESSA, uh, which was already in commerce, uh, and it was the largest element of the new NOAA. Uh, elements that came from other organizations, such as the Department of Interior, the Navy, the National Science Foundation, uh, the US Coast Guard, and last but not least, uh, the Corps of Engineers, specifically the research programs of the Lake Survey Office. These became, the Lake Survey programs became the um, National Ocean Survey Lake Survey Center within NOAA. Um, this also made NOAA the lead agency for the IFIGL program, and in 1972, an IFIGL project office was established in Rockville, Maryland. Now, when uh, NOAA was created, uh, because maybe because the Weather uh, Bureau, or ESSA rather, was uh, the largest incoming component, Bob White was also named the first administrator of NOAA. Uh, in 1972, when the IFIGL Project Office was created, uh, Dr. Gene Aubert became the director. Um, during 19, whoops, uh, oh, skip the slide, that's okay. During 1973, Albert proposed creation of a third NOAA wet lab, wet lab to be in the Great Lakes. And the, the uh, instigation for this was in, that in 1973, NOAA established a marine research presence on both coasts, the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Lab in, in Miami, Florida, and the Pacific Marine Environment, uh, Environmental Lab uh, in Seattle, Washington. Uh, so not to be outdone, um, Albert proposed creating a Great Lakes lab. After all, we were the third coast. Um, Laurel was uh, officially, let me see where I am here. Okay, so Glural was officially established in 1974 uh, and located to be, to be located in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, the picture here on the left is reported to show Gene Aubert when he announced in 1974 in the city of Detroit that this new lab was being created and moved to to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, but I can't verify that that's actually where this picture's from. Um, let's see. So to recap, the dates that are very key to Glural's existence were 1841, creation of the Lake Survey, 65, the creation of ESSA, establishment of the IHD leading to the uh, plans that eventually developed into IFIGL, 69, the Stratton Commission report, 70, the creation of NOAA, 1972, establishment of the IFIGL Project Office in NOAA with Gene Aubert as its director. 1973, when Aubert successfully proposed the NOAA wet lab for the Great Lakes. Um, Bob White becoming the first ESSA and then NOAA administrator, <coughs> excuse me, and Gene Aubert uh, joining the government to take over the IFIGL Project Office in 1972 played a critical and fortuitous role in Glural's creation because Aubert and White had worked together at Traveler's Insurance on weather-related phenomena, um, and uh, they were very close friends. And I suspect, this is just my speculation, my, su my supposition, that establishing a permanent research lab in the Great Lakes did not uh, exactly engender a lot of uh, interest and support within the most of the hierarchy of NOAA, but I believe that Aubert's friendship with Bob White tilted it to the direction of plural being, being approved and, and uh, <clears throat> and and, and uh, formed. Uh, by the way, although Gene Aubert was a fierce defender of the Great Lakes, uh, he had a PhD from MIT on geophysics of the atmosphere. So he was an atmospheric scientist, uh, at least by training. So um, this is a brief review of the first 
five, well, three actual permanent directors and two, two temporary directors that led GLIRL through these first 25 years. Gene Orbert, who retired in 1986. Frank Quinn, who is the uh, head of the hydrology group and GLIRL senior hydrologist, uh, took over as acting for the period between then and when Al Beaton was, uh, came on board later in 86. When Beaton retired in 96, Pete Landrum, who was our senior toxicologist, um, took over as acting until Steve Brandt, I point the pointer at you, but I don't want to blind you, but he's in the audience over here. You can raise your hand. Um, took over in 1997, uh, and he extended past the, the term of my talk. So, uh, But they, they all um, deserve credit for guiding uh, GLURL through what were really a fraught 25 years of existence. So if you look at the organizational program history, when it started out, there were four science group, uh, well, three science groups and, and, a, and a fourth group that was modeling. And so lake hydrology continued the, the uh, work that was being done by the lake survey. Uh, chemistry and biology were um, mostly reflecting the, the uh, uh, IFIGL program in the intensive field year on Lake Ontario in 1972. There was a huge number of samples to be processed. There was uh, uh, data compilation from all of the, the partners that were involved in that program. Uh, a lot of chemistry and biology uh, uh, data from them also. Uh, and then um, physical and knowledge and meteorology uh, also absorbed um, work that was started by the Lake Survey and also that was a reflection of the intensive IFIGL field year. So they were organized around really four basic science um, uh, topics, and it's hydrology, chemistry, and biology, and then physics, meaning circulation, uh, movement, uh, oscillations, and, and the marine hazards. The other group, Environmental Systems Engineering, was uh, essentially a modeling group that was, and an information services group. Their role was to take Laurel products, uh, also create models, and put them out for use by the user community outside of Laurel. There were also um, support groups like the Marine Instrumentation Lab, the computer facility, and the library. They were present throughout the history of GLURL. Um, they, GLURL could not have produced what it did without those organizations being there. Uh, and they were extremely critical to GLURL's success. So in 1980, so um, in 1982 though, by 1982, uh, the emphasis in the Great Lakes had shifted to being concerned about toxic organics, which were found to be accumulating in the sediments and basically were associated with the particle dynamics of the Great Lakes. So the original chemistry and biology single group that was when GLURL was first formed uh, was split into two groups, the Synthetic Organics and Particle Dynamics Group, or SOPD, and the Ecosystem and Nutrient Dynamics Group, or END. Um, the Ecosystem and Nutrient Dynamics title also reflected a, a renewed focus on the issue of, uh, of um, phosphorus loading and, and other nutrient loading in the Great Lakes and how they were affecting the dynamics uh, and uh, of the uh, ecosystem, uh, biological succession, and things like that. So those titles reflected a narrowing, if you would, of the focus of those two particular um, categories of research. Lake hydrology and physical analogy continued to do what they do. Environmental system studies was just another name for the original uh, environmental engineering group, and they continued to do what I said they do. So. Um, that was through 19 through that was through Director Albert's final years, and when G, uh, when uh, Al Beaton took over in 1986, he spent a few years examining the structure of the lab, talking to the staff. They had a retreat where they talked about all this. And in 19, um, see, I believe it was like 1989, maybe it's 1990. Um, the lab was again restructured. Uh, the four. Um, organ uh, the four research groups were combined into two uh, divisions, the Biogeochemical Sciences Division and the Physical Sciences Division. The uh, modeling group as a separate entity went away and was absorbed into those divisions. And then instead of having a stovepipe research organizations where we had projects listed vertically under each of these groups, the idea was to create coordinated research programs under major topical areas, but within the 
these major research program areas like pollutant effects or, or, or water resources, et cetera, there were projects and the project teams for each of those projects were an interdisciplinary group that came from both divisions. Um, at the same time, uh, there were independent research projects run by individual scientists. There, and then eventually during the same time period between 90 and 98, uh, other NOAA-wide programs were added to the mix and then even other agency programs. Um, I also want to mention that in the FY88 annual report, that was the first mention of the word climate change and it was in a project under the Lake Hydrology Group. Uh, and later on, of course, it became a major program. Um, in uh, 1997, Steve Brandt took over as director and uh, uh, following, I guess, um, uh, the lead of his, his uh, former directors, he reorganized the lab, whoops, I went, went, went too far. He re reorganized the lab uh, into a science and technology, stay there, support branch, uh, Lake F Michigan Field Station and the science branch. Um, I think this is on a timer now, not, not intentionally. Anyhow, so again, a narrowing of the, of the organizational structure. And I couldn't find, um, a, a, a depiction of the actual program structure then, but I got this slide from uh, Laura Newland from a 2002 presentation Steve gave. And it shows you that basically the program structure uh, under the, the new organizational structure that he created pretty much stayed with the tried and true plural um, uh, topics. Um, now, very quickly, the Reagan years, this is where the lab was fraught with, uh, with um, real threat, and that is that the, in, uh, Reagan came into office, he wanted to cut the federal deficit, uh, and the uh, Office of Management Budget ordered all the agency, the uh, departments to put up programs to be cut. NOAA put up GLURL, and uh, it was accepted. And so starting in the FY82 Reagan budget, GLURL was zeroed out of the budget, and that went, six, that went uh, again and again through, nine, through FY86. But a concerted effort by the Great Lakes congressional leaders were successful in adding GLURL funding back to the budget each year. Um, however, if you look at 1982 to 1999, survival doesn't mean you were healthy. So these were what I call the lean years. Survival was uncertain, first of all, to year to year, from year to year. So the staff didn't know what to expect. They didn't know if they're gonna have a job the following year or not. And so um, long-term planning of research projects was also difficult because you didn't know if it was gonna end next year either. Uh, so uh, the biggest problem, though, was level or almost level funding versus inflation. You can see, if you look at the table, uh, starting in 82, our uh, uh, budget was about 3.6 million. By 1986, it was with inflation, adjustment for inflation was 3.2 million. And by 91, it was still only about 3.4 million. So um, 1989, the zebra mussel, as, as Deb pointed out, was, was uh, reported in Lake St. Clair. And so for four years or five years after that, uh, GLURL re re uh, received a $1.1 million add-on by Congress, which uh, really um, helped get GLURL back onto a fairly firm financial footing. I would say also in 1995, there was one, uh, that, that during this first 25 years, there was a repeated attempt to close GLURL, which failed, uh, but that's another story. So, um, Yeah, okay, so uh, I guess what you would say, because the zebra mussel being found in Lake St. Clair resulted in GLURL getting this huge infusion of funds, you could say that the zebra mussel helped GLURL muscle its way through. That's my joke for the day. Uh, you know, I couldn't have done this. I've been out of the lab for 14 years, so uh, uh, I had a lot of help from... Uh, uh, former Gloralites, existing Gloralites. And so I want to thank all these retirees, Glenn Muir, Dave Schwab, Frank Quinn, Peter Landrum, and George Leskovich, who all gave me the benefit of their memory of the lab before I got there. I got there in 85. Some of these guys were there in 1974 or 75. So they had that corporate memory I didn't have. Um, thanks, of course, to uh, Deb Lee, a current director. Um, did I take that picture out? Oh, too bad. I. I had, a, I had a slide here of, of showing Debbie Lee in about 1993 sitting in front of the first Coast Watch station, but I guess I took that out. And, uh, uh, and also Laura Newell and Nicole Rice and Ashley, Ashley Elgin. Uh, Ashley invited me to do this. 
and Laura and Nicole both helped provide with, with material. Thank you.